Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2020. Uh, I'll ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off electronic devices or switch them to silent mode so they don't affect the committee's work. Uh, we have apologies from our convener, Jenny Mara, this morning, uh, so I'm taking the chair, uh, and I welcome David Stewart, who attends in place of Jenny. Uh, item one on our agenda is a decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items three and four in private? Yep. Thank you. Uh, item two on our agenda is a consideration of a section 22 report on the 2018-19 audit of the Scottish Police Authority. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning. We have Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Mark Roberts, Audit Director, Performance Audit and Best Value, and Stephen Boyle, Audit Director, Audit Services, both of Audit Scotland. I'd like to invite the Auditor General to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener, and Happy New Year to you and members of the committee. Today's report, um, Convener, is presented under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act on the 2018-19 Order of the Scottish Police Authority. It's the sixth consecutive report I've prepared following the annual audit of the SPA. The auditor, Stephen Boyle, on my right, has given an unqualified opinion on the annual report and accounts for 2018-19. The SPA has maintained the improvements in the quality of its accounting that I reported on last year, and there have been clear improvements in its financial reporting. The annual report and accounts were signed off earlier than in previous years, and the financial statements were of a good standard. I welcome the progress the SPA has made, but the organisation continues to face considerable challenges. In 2018-19, the SPA's operating deficit was £35.6 million. This was agreed with the Scottish Government and accommodated from elsewhere in the Scottish Budget. Plans to achieve financial balance in 2020-21 will not now be achieved. This is due in part to planning for the impact of EU withdrawal, which has meant that the planned reduction in police officer numbers has been postponed. The SPA now needs to reach agreement with the Scottish Government on how it will achieve financial balance in the longer term, while still delivering its strategy, Policing 2026. Robust workforce planning is an essential part of the SPA's overall financial planning. The workforce accounts for about 85% of Police Scotland's expenditure, and having the right workforce in place is also crucial to delivering Policing 2026, so detailed workforce plans are therefore needed urgently. Finally, the recent resignation of the chair of the SPA highlights the continuing lack of clarity about the, how the system of policing in Scotland should operate and the roles and responsibilities of all those involved. The SPA and Police Scotland were established in 2013, almost seven years ago now. As I reported at the time, this was a major piece of public service reform carried out very quickly and its history since then has been turbulent. In my view, it's now time for a review of, of the way in which the system of governance and accountability as, accountability as a whole is operating, taking in the roles played by the Scottish Government, HMICS and the PERC, as well as the SPA and Police Scotland. In order to protect public confidence, it's essential that everyone involved has a shared understanding of how the SPA will fulfil the role envisaged for it by the legislation and what else is required for it to do so. Thank you, Convener. My colleagues and I will do our best to answer the committee's questions. Uh, thank you, Auditor General. Uh, we'll open questions from Alec Neil. Okay. Happy New Year, Auditor General. Uh, uh, can I just um, start off where you laid off there about the future? I mean, here we are again. We've got a temporary chair and an interim chief executive. Um, and while progress has been made undoubtedly, particularly in reporting of financial uh, matters and so on, we still, in terms of the stability of the organisation at the top of the organisation, have some serious questions. The departing chair clearly made a number of statements which suggest that all is not right in the SPA. So <coughs> your suggestion of a review what would the remit of that review be? Should it be an independent review, a parliamentary review, a, 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 a public inquiry? I mean, what format do you envisage? What, what would be the purpose of that review and who should do it? I'll, I'll take a step back from you, the, the, your final question, though, Mr Neil, if I may, to start with. Um, as I said in my opening statement, um, the SBA, Police Scotland, the new system of policing in Scotland have been in place since... Uh, 
early 2012 now, so nearly seven years. Um, in that time, we've had four chief constables, three chairs, um, a series of uh, concerns raised about the way the SPA has operated. Mm. Um, and my team and I have, as you, as you would expect, thought very carefully about both what we've seen through our work and the wider picture. Um, and it seems to me that as I say in the report, there is not a clear and shared understanding of the roles of all of the players involved here, not just the SPA, but Police Scotland, the Inspectorate, the Government, all of the people who have a role to play. Yeah. Over that time, um, other parts of the system have grown and changed. So the Justice Committee has established a subcommittee on policing, which plays a role here. The policing sponsor division within government is now, I think, around 40 people, so a very significant um, scale of um, team in its own right um, and there is a, a real focus on making sure that the system as a whole works for, from my point of view rather than just the SPA itself. Um, the, the SPA does need to develop its own capacity and capability as I say in the report um, but for me the focus needs to be on the way the system as a whole works together to, to deliver this really delicate balance between making sure that policing is properly held to account in the way that we all expect given the powers that police have over our lives, our rights and freedoms, but also that it is accountable in a democratic society and that policing continues to be delivered by consent. So does that mean you see this as a kind of independent review looking at the entirety in terms of the management uh, and delivery of policing in Scotland for the future? Yes, I think my concern is, is to make sure that we don't keep on focusing just on the SPA itself. The SPA has got a very yeah. important role to play, um, and, and as the uh, Chief Inspector of Constabulary has highlighted, that can be done in different ways. I think what we need to do is to look at the system as a whole. In a sense, it's not for me to set out how that should be done, but I think it could be done by Parliament or by government. Um, for me, that, that's less important that, than that it looks at the system of policing as a whole rather than an individual part of it. Yeah. And, and the fact you mentioned 40 people in the Scottish Government in the sponsoring department looking at what's happening on top of all the staff in the SPA, all the staff in the police, the inspectorate, and you know, all the other bits round about it, forensics and so on, seems quite a lot of 40 people in a sponsoring department. I think that that's the sponsor division for policing in Scotland, but I agree with you, it is a big team, and I think it's grown since 2013 um, because of the, the history of events and because of the uh, felt need for there to be that oversight of what's happening in policing. Okay. Um, as I say, we, we've grown the system to, in response to events, the establishment of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing as well. What we haven't done is step back and say, is the whole system system working as intended other, un, under the legislation. Right. So looking to the future and taking into consideration the comments of the departing chair um, and the comments you've made about the financial situation, um, <coughs> can I ask, I mean clearly the, 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 the immediate period in terms of the financial situation is still quite worrying given that, um, as you say, the deficit is estimated to carry on as things stand potentially until 2022. So in terms of the financial situation, does that mean that closing that deficit is contingent on shedding the kind of manpower figures referred to in your report, nearly 800 officers? Or is that a deficit because we still keep those numbers of officers? I'll ask Stephen to come in in a moment. Um, when I reported last year, um, I reported that there was a plan in place to achieve financial balance by 2021-22, which um, was contingent on um, moving away from the fixed um, uh, target of 17234 officers and reshaping the workforce overall. Um, the plans that came forward during 2018-19 um, were uh, to not make the reductions in police officer numbers that were planned um, attributed to the requirements of uh, the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Um, what happens next is exactly the question that, that you're describing, and I'll ask Stephen to pick that up for Can you. I just ask in answering, Stephen, could you give me an indication of the number of officers uh, required for the EU function and whether, given where we now are in terms of the EU, whether um, those officers are still required? I'll do my best, Mr Neil. Actually, I may not have the, the specific number that, that you're looking for in terms of officer numbers. Order of magnitude. Um, in terms of... Um, if, if I'm able to step back a second, I'll do my best to, to, to cover that point. Yeah. Um, 
we absolutely agree with you the point about the financial sustainability um, of um, the Scottish Police Authority, which reflects the overall spending of, of Police Scotland, um, is undoubtedly challenged. We comment, you know, it's one of the main themes in our report about that financial sustainability not being on an even keel. Um, the, the Chief Finance Officer took, um, the, I guess, the most recent report to the Scottish Police Authority board meeting in September, which really outlined two scenarios, two options to return to financial balance, one of which is, was to reduce uh, police numbers by 750, a number that's been I think, talked about um, over um, a significant period of time to deliver that financial balance, <clears throat> or else the second scenario, to receive an uplift in funding um, essentially from, from government. The, the delay in achieving financial balance that had previously been anticipated by, by 2021 uh, was um, referred, the, the, the rationale for that was on the basis of the operational requirements to meet the implications of the uh, UK leaving the European Union. And from an operational perspective, the Chief Constable said that it wasn't, wouldn't be possible to reduce police officer numbers by that in order to maintain an effective policing service. And, and for that rationale, that, that had an implication for uh, when policing would return to financial balance. Um, I probably don't have the specific number that you're looking for in terms of, but it's something that we can uh, come back to supply. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that there's a real, one of the options being looked at is reducing the number of officers from around 17,200 odd effectively down to under 16,500. Exactly that. That, that was the scenario. Is that seriously it, being considered? <clears throat> so, and, and it's being considered in the context of um, the delivery of financial balance. So wh wh how much money then, how much additional money, and obviously the budget process is in a bit of a hiatus at the moment for reasons we all know, but in terms of next year and the year after that, um, how much additional money is the SPA going to require in order not to have to shed 750 officers? So the <clears throat> next, in the current financial year in, in 1920, um, the SPA is forecasting a deficit of 25 million pounds, um, and through That's to with the existing <clears throat> within 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 the existing <coughs> funding level, and, and as we touch on in the report that it's able to continue delivering services by receipt of um, cash allocations to allow it to continue functioning during the year. And, we've, and, we, and we capture that in, in, in around £35 million pounds is provided by the Scottish Government for it to continue to, to providing operations. It's also received um, a £17 million pounds, um, one-off allocation from the Scottish Government to allow it to meet the costs of um, of Brexit, EU-related costs. So, so both those two factors added together, so in, in the region of £42 million, pounds is the operational implication of continuing to deliver services added on with the EU context. So it's tens of millions of pounds is needed in order to meet that scenario of not reducing um, officer numbers to move the SPA from its current um, position. It's been around for really many years of receiving um, government support over and above its overall grant and allocate, um, allocation from government in a way, to, if it, the government chooses to do, to rebalance um, the financial position of the Scottish Police Authority. So bottom line, in order if for the SBA to properly plan the services it has to provide and make sure it has the officers to deliver those services over the next two financial years, how much additional money does it require over that two-year period? So for the current, the current financial year, if, as it's projecting, is a, it's received £17 million in the 1920 uh, financial year. Yeah. It's, it anticipates that it will receive um, effectively cash funding to match the £25 million deficit um, that it will require during the 1920 uh, financial, current financial year. Is that year. not confirmed? Well, no. Um, or is it? I'm, I'd probably need to come back to you, Mr Neil, in, in writing. I think there's a an inherent assumption that it will continue to receive that as it's done in, in previous years. Otherwise, you know, there, there would be very significant cash flow implications um, for in terms of you know, meeting its, its obligations as they fell due. So are you saying then there's no shortfall in funding for the next two years? No, 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 no sorry to be clear, no, that's not what I'm saying. In terms of the SPA's financial position has had to be supported over and above its funding allocation 
right. with additional cash provision. So uh, what I want the to know year. then is, in the budget that we're going to have to have at some point in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. how much of an additional funding allocation for the next two financial years, starting in April this year, does the SPA need to avoid um, having to reduce its number, the number of officers by 750 or so? I'll, I'll do my best to give you a, a, probably a, a broad figure, maybe one for the SPA to give you the specifics of, of what they need, and I suspect m much of that will come through the budget <coughs> that the Chief Finance Officer will take to the SPA board um, in March. But essentially, it will be... <clears throat> tens of millions of pounds, I would assume in, in the region of 40 to 50 million pounds that it, that it would require in order not to have to continue to receive cash allocations during the course of the next Is that per year, year or is that for the two years? I, I see that would be my assumption and estimate that's over the course of both two financial years and but, but it's probably the specifics of it is maybe a question for um, SP or, or Police Scotland. Right. But, but in terms of order of magnitude, yeah. an additional funding allocation of about £40 million pounds over the next two financial years of, is required to maintain the existing numbers of officers. Of that order, Mr Neil, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I I'd like to stay with the same sort of area for me. I, <clears throat> coming back to the SPA and how we get to this point, the, your report, as, as Mr Neil's just examined, it, it looks at that financial balance will not be achieved uh, because the Chief Constable postponed the planned reduction in the police officer numbers. So, but given that you said within an answer to Mr Neil that uh, a lot of this was to do, or this was around the EU withdrawal planning, to what extent could this have been foreseen and planned for by the SPA? Uh, and the second question that, that arises from that is how much control does the SPA actually have on budget and decisions if the Chief Constable is in a position to just say, I need the officers and that's what's going to happen? I think that's a very good question, convener. Um, my first comment would be that I'm not sure anybody could have predicted the events surrounding Brexit last year, um, the SPA, SPA and nobody else. It was a, a turbulent year in all sorts of ways as we headed towards the um, end of 2019. Um, the wider point and the, the more central point to this is that I think the SPA is um, fundamentally reliant on Police Scotland, on the Chief Constable, for things like workforce planning. That's one of the reasons why I started off this morning by saying I think that the question is not just the functions of the SPA and the way they're carried out, but the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved in policing in Scotland. Um, I've been reporting since 2013-14 about the central importance of having good workforce plans um, for policing in any case because of the financial sustainability gap that was apparent at that time. But um, increasingly, as uh, Police Scotland has done some of the work around policing 2026, which has highlighted um, changing public expectations, changes in technology, changes in types of crime, and the need for policing to change to respond to it. Um, we've seen the concerns about the um, effect on the uh, police staff workforce of maintaining the uh, target of 17,234 police officers and questions about whether that's leading to the right allocation of work between uh, police officers and civilian staff um, and we don't yet have um, detailed workforce plans for the way in which policing 2026 will be delivered with I think likely a different mix of staff than that we've required in the past. Now it's difficult for the SPA to do that without the Police Scotland team preparing the information, the detail that's required based on a professional policing perspective. But the SPA, without having that workforce plan, can't then do the financial planning, which would be needed to engage with government on what the priorities are and how they get funded. So th there is a, a really circular element to this. And my concern is that the SPA is in the spotlight, but the system as a whole needs to be operating well for this to be a functioning and effective way of organising police in Scotland. Mm. Mark, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. No, I don't, don't, I don't think so. I think that's... No, I've nothing further to add. Well, on that financial planning, the SPA, you say, has identified two options. And again, Mr Neil is right to explore this. It, it, uh, in terms of the medium term financial situation, uh, one of the suggestions is, that, as, as you've said, Auditor General, you adjust the mix and the structure of the workforce. And the other option uh, is to receive additional funding. Now, 
we know from your report that there are no immediate plans to change, to reduce the workforce. Uh, but equally, we also know from your report that the financial situation will be driven by the budget. Uh, so might it be suggested that neither of these options, as identified in the planning, are feasible? In an ideal world, what, what we would like to see, I think, is what we've been calling for since 2013, which is really strong, robust workforce plans that say this is what policing will look like in 10, 20 years' time. Here is the workforce we need to deliver that, including police officers, new types of specialists in cybercrime and, and other um, specialisms, and here's the civilian staff needed to um, support that way of working. Um, it, it's affected by different use of ICT and therefore probably needs different um, estates and buildings around the country from what we have here. Um, and all of that would then play into the financial plan. We don't have that. What we have is projections of the costs of carrying out policing as it currently is in broad terms and then of either increasing or decreasing the number of um, police officers as and staff around it and that feeds back to a budget number. Now, in the absence of workforce plans, there's a sense in which that's all you can do. But the workforce planning, I think, is, is the really important way of making sure policing is fit for the future and provides the best basis for saying, what can we afford and how do we prioritise and balance the two from there? It has to be iterative, but I think starting with the workforce plans would be a much better way forward. Auditor General, the question that arises from that, then, if you've been calling for that since 2013... <laughs> Uh, and, and this is not news to this committee in terms of all of the areas that we look at. The workforce planning on any of the things we look at is, is uh, key. Uh, so who, on whom is the onus to be doing that and who hasn't done that for the last seven years? Um, I think, as I said in response to your question earlier, the only people who can do the detailed professional planning um, are the leaders of Police Scotland um, with support from the, the teams and the people that they employ. The SPA has a really clear responsibility in testing and probing, probing how that matches up against policing 2026, 20 the policing priorities, uh, the strategic direction set by government. Um, but in, in professional terms, it would be very odd for anybody except Police Scotland to be preparing those plans as the people responsible for operational policing and for delivering, um, for understanding the way policing is developing in a professional sense here in Scotland and globally. Thank you. Um, the question might be for Stephen Boyle here. The, the annual report talks about this 100 extra officers, or 100 officers were recruited uh, recently, relatively recently, to reverse a reduction of 100 officers. Now, that is not cost neutral. I, 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 I'm not an expert on police recruitment, uh, but I do know from a previous life that it costs money to reduce a workforce and it costs quite a lot of money to re-increase a workforce. Uh, so what were the additional costs of, first of all, the reduction and then the re-recruitment? Just to, if, if I'm clear, convener, it's paragraph 45 of the annual audit report you're referring to. Um, in terms of the, the reduction of police officer numbers, it's perhaps not as, as significant cost implications as, as you might uh, anticipate. I, uh, it's our expectation these aren't related to exit costs or, or redundancy arrangements. With a workforce of 17,000 and, and a, a police officer cohort of 11,000 approximately within that number, there's a significant level of churn within, within that. So, um, and given the volume of recruitment that, that takes place within policing, there is, they, are, they are able to vary the pace of rec recruitment in a way that doesn't require them to defer to um, redundancy to measures should they so wish to, to do so. Um, I'd probably be able to just, like yourself, give a, an approximate figure of what the implications, but for 100 police officers, we would assume that would be in the order of about £4 million pounds or so to, to bring on to the police force for, for a full year effect uh, cost implication. Like with all of these, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to give approximate answers, but I think perhaps uh, Police Scotland themselves can give the, the specific costs as to you know, what that would cost them. Thank you. Convener, it's just worth remembering that it's not possible to make police officers redundant, so yes. the, the workforce has to reduce naturally, and then recruitment um, makes up the gap from there. So worth being clear for all of us of that, I think. Yes, thank you. Uh, final 
question for me is the your report indicates that medium term financial position remains challenging uh, and we've looked earlier on that there's no funding currently available beyond 2019-20 to support the additional officers do you get any indication of how the scottish government is responding to that position i think the scottish government um in its uh programme uh, published in the autumn um, was very supportive of the need to uh, maintain policing for the future. What we don't have is the detail of what that means in cash terms. As Stephen said, there is a budget deficit planned again for this year and then the future years after that neither the expenditure nor the revenue um, sides of the equation are clear. Um, we understand that the two scenarios referred to in my report will be the basis for discussion between the SPA Police Scotland and government, um, but it's obviously very important that we move to something which is more uh, planned and more sustainable than uh, filling a budget deficit year by year, in some instances quite late towards the end of the financial year concerned. Thank you. Anna Sarwa. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning and Happy New Year. Um, or General, you'll probably, you'll probably guess the area that I'm going to focus on, which is around workforce. Um, you, you mentioned in the um, report around the need to have a urgently prepared or detailed workforce plan. Obviously, that connects to policing, but actually right across the board, across the Scottish Government, there are challenges around workforce planning. And can you say a little bit around what some of the challenges have been around developing a workforce plan, particularly around policing, and what that might mean in terms of vacancy rates and in terms of the, the skills gaps that exist? Um, I'll ask Mark Roberts to come in in a moment, um, and I think the only thing I'd say in um, lead into Mark is that we know many organisations find workforce planning difficult. Um, as the convener said, we've seen that in the NHS quite recently in this committee. Um, I think one of the things that I've reported previously that's made it more difficult in relation to policing has been the, the, the floor, if you like, of 17,234 officers, which meant that financial pressures could be responded to only by reducing the number of police staff. And that has led to concerns that police officers were then doing work that police staff were better able to do or could have done at lower cost. So that's been an additional complexity in workforce planning um, for policing. Mark, can I? Yes, just, just a bit to build on that. I think the, um, the fact that there's been so little financial flexibility has meant that there has not been the kind of um, headroom to, um, to shift balances of the, the workforce, both in terms of the, the balance between um, off, um, police officers and civilian staff and also the skills mix that exists within that. Um, certainly in the early days of um, the SPA in Police Scotland, there was reform funding available, um, but our understanding was that, that to a, a large degree that was used to um, maintain day-to-day -day operational spending in order to try and reduce the scale of the deficits that they'd had. Um, so that opportunity which might have been there to invest that money to shift the workforce in a different way wasn't able to be um, taken, but that comes back, as the Auditor General says, to, to the very, very significant strengths that the finances and the floor number of 17234 placed on, on the manoeuvrability that Police Scotland mm. had in terms of um, shifting its, its workforce. The need for a workforce shift is very clearly articulated in Policing 2026 in terms of what the future challenges are and how the workforce may need to, to adapt um, in the future. Um, but as I say, there just hasn't been the, the, the space, the wriggle room in order to, um, to move towards that. Yeah. And, and similar, similar again to the, to the NHS, you, you mentioned with Policing 2026, is sometimes you can have the best plan in the world, but it's still not going to work because there'll be a balance between having the right plan, um, finding the right people, uh, having the right skills mix, but also whether, crucially, we have enough people which is one of the challenges I think we have uh, in Scotland. Where, where do you think that balance lies in terms of some of the challenges around uh, policing 2026? I think that's, that's a very hard question to answer. One example of an area that, that, that springs to mind in terms of one that would be very, very challenging is within the area of cybercrime, which is clearly identified as, as a, a growing issue. Um, it's a, a challenging area across the public sector and beyond in order to rec recruit people with the right skill sets in order to, to, to work in that, that field. So that's something which I, I, I think Police Scotland have, have, have kind of identified as a big issue. But again, as with all other organisations, they're operating in a very competitive market mm. in order to try and sort of access the, the people with the skills to, to work on that type of issue. I, I suppose a, a broader question is, do you think that 
do you think there's more the Scottish Government can do to try and get one better workforce planning in place across the public sector, but also finding better connections between how we how we identify the skills gaps and, and attract people to Scotland if we don't have those immediate skills in Scotland and workforce planning? Is there something structurally that's a challenge here rather than specifically just to policing 2026? I think there's structurally there's um, there's always more that can be done to kind of work across different sectors. You you mentioned the, the NHS, an example. Obviously, a huge workforce in the NHS. We have reported previously on workforce planning in, in the NHS and what needs to be done to improve, improve there. Um, there's always more that can be done to be sharing good practice and experience across different sectors of government, which, which does happen in some cases and doesn't happen in other cases. So I think that's something that, in terms of not a structural solution, perhaps a behavioural and cultural solution might be... Um, to be encouraged. Uh, and just uh, the last question um, to, to yourself, Auditor General. Do you think that perhaps it's an area of work that Audit Scotland might do, considering looking at all the reports that we that we do get, almost all, if not all, mention workforce challenges, mention vacancy rates, mention skills challenges. Do you think there might be a, a piece of work that Audit Scotland might do that tries to bring together some of that challenge right across the public sector around workforce planning, identifying vacancy rates and the skills mix? Just to, just to highlight that much deeper challenge I think we face across the entire public sector in terms of finding the right skills mix, finding the right number of people and, and solving the workforce challenges across the board. As always, Mr Sawa, um, the, the challenge for us is what we don't do rather than what we do do with the resources that we have available. Um, There's as, workforce challenges at Audit Scotland. Then, in there the are indeed, <laughs> um, as, as in all public sector bodies. Um, I'll certainly take the idea away and look at um, what we may be able to do. Um, I think we have already, we, we place a lot of premium on uh, providing good practice guidance for members of public bodies and for um, government from the things that we find and we've done some of that in relation to workforce planning previously. Um, the other thing I'd say though that adds to what Mark was saying is that I think um, even where we see workforce planning working well in one sector, what we're not seeing is joining the dots mm -hmm. across the public sector. Um, so we know that police officers can spend a lot of time looking after people with mental health problems because they can't get a quick response mm -hmm. from the health service with people with specialist mental health skills. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think maybe we could do more to identify those sorts of connections and linkages that would both help to reduce the pressures on budgets and on the workforce of people working in public services, but also potentially provide a better service to the people across Scotland who need it. Thank you. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, a few questions on the digital ICT strategy that's mentioned in the uh, Report to Auditor General. We know that in 2018 the strategy was produced um, that set out the business case and a figure was put of about £298 million required to deliver it over the next nine years or so. You've said that in the report. Now, given our experience with the, the I 6 project, I think it's reasonable and understandable that there's a more robust analysis of the, the business case taking place within government, but could you could you give us some kind of flavour of where we, we are generally with this at the moment? Stephen, do you want to pick that one up? <coughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, you're right in terms of the numbers you quote, uh, Mr Coffey. Just for um, completeness, the, the £298 million pounds, um, is analysed in terms of anticipated revenue requirement of £254 million and, and capital of uh, £44 million pounds for the two years. Uh, sorry, for uh, the split. Um, Progress isn't uh, as was anticipated or, or hoped for um, by Police Scotland in terms of the investment that it would be able to deliver in terms of the timeline. There was some allowance made for that in terms of progress, I think they, partly in reflection, on reflection by them into the I-6 project. The strategy was designed to be modular in terms of its implementation in a way that it allowed for variations in availability of funding, or project um, delivery timescales, um, so that, in fact, to all intents and purposes, all the eggs were in one basket, and that also extended to using a anticipated broader range um, of suppliers as also for the delivery of the project. That capital funding wasn't provided um, as uh, as had been anticipated, meant that progress hasn't gone as uh, as quickly as anticipated. The main example of, you know, of where progress has happened has been with the uh, the handheld devices uh, for police officers. 
uh, and moving away from um, I think there was a lot of talk at the time about police officers continuing to have to make written notes when uh, uh, interviewing uh, interview situations or with members of the public and able to access um, smart devices and technology on the doorstep, as it were. Um, much of the other investment requirement was also about aspects of improving some of the back office functions um, within Police Scotland. And the committee will, not, will be aware that for many years there's been an underinvestment within police um, IT infrastructure to the extent that there have been this kind of a range of systems that don't connect effectively uh, with one another and the extent of multiple keying of um, evidence or, um, or interview uh, notes by, by officers. So the system was, the investment requirement was designed to modernise all of that requirement. Um, it's anticipated by Police Scotland that that will still happen in due course, but it really is dependent on the availability of funding that, it, that comes through. And again, it's another aspect of why the service hasn't transformed at the pace that it uh, expected that it would do so. And all of that has connections with both workforce implications and the financial balance um, in due course as well. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, I, I know that an additional 11 million was allocated for that mobile device project. Is that partly addressing one of the, the purposes that was in the I-6? As I understand it, that was about replacing about 130 or so electronic and paper-based systems for crime reporting. Is that what the mobile system is partially or That's, that's my understanding. So, that, so that's contained within that, but okay, so that, that's encouraging to hear that, but do you, do you see it to just operating over the next few years in a kind of modular piecemeal fashion, if I could use that phrase, that they'll pick off projects that are affordable and deliverable in the short term? Are, do, are they trying to seek agreement for a whole strategic vision for ICT to take us to 2026? How, 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 are, they, how are they doing it? I'd probably be making assumptions, Mr Coffey, about as to the the extent to which Police Scotland is able to implement its digital data and ICT strategy is very clearly aligned to its funding requirement to um, replace its existing uh, technology infrastructure and bring in uh, new capital investment uh, associated with it. Um, so I, I, it, the availability of funding uh, as it becomes available will absolutely dictate the pace of which transformation can happen. Um, and as and I think the other aspect, that, as, uh, as Mark Roberts mentions, about that it can also access the level of ICT <coughs> skills uh, in, to support its workforce transformation alongside the investment in technology itself. Yeah. Do, do you have any indication when we, it might be a bit clearer about the government's view on the strategic vision for ICT? Or any I sense of when we might get a, a handle on when that will be? I, I'm assuming that will come through in the, the next budget that the the Parliament approves for um, an yeah. aspect of what, what that means for, for Police Scotland and its ICT infrastructure investments. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Willie. Uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, Order General, broadly there seems to be quite a few areas where there's been some good progress getting made. Inevitably, I guess, we've got to look at the negative bits as well. Um, I like to look how we look at leadership and governance, but before I do so, I'd like to just check on potential costs here and in paragraph 18 you're talking about seven new board members are any of these additional are there additional costs around it you talk about the chief executive but there's an interim chief executive i'm not sure from when but is there an additional cost to that uh, that that interim chief executive is going to be extended <laughs> apparently until november 2020 uh, and you talk here about a new chief constable three new Deputy Chief Constables and several new Assistant Chief Constables. Are there additional costs around that? There isn't a simple yes or no answer to that question, I'm afraid. The information that you referred to in paragraph 18 was specifically about recruitment. Um, and I think in every case except the Chief Executive, there were some additional posts and some replacements for people who were leaving or moving on for different reasons. Um, the team will keep me straight. Um, I think when the new chair was appointed in December 2017, um, she... Uh, uh, made some appointments to vacancies on the board and also um, looked at succession planning when people were due to leave and made sure there were plans in place to, to bring the board up to full complement. Um, so there was an additional cost over what was being spent, but not in 
not in relation to what was planned for the authority as a whole in its membership. Um, the new chief executive was, was appointed in October 2018 to replace the um, interim chief uh, officer who um, came to the end of his uh, secondment from government to see through the SPA. Um, so it wasn't an additional cost in that sense. It was a replacement of somebody who'd been there on an interim basis. Um, the new chief constable obviously replaced the former chief constable, um, and there was then a review of the, the structure of the senior team and recruitment to the vacancies that existed at that point. I'm not sure if Stephen or Mark want to add anything to that, but it, it, it's that sort of picture of recruitment to vacancies and one or two additional posts. I suppose I'm just trying to find out, are we recruiting more chiefs at the expense of Indians here? Um, I think there has been a growth in the size of the leadership team in Police Scotland. I don't have the detailed <coughs> figures here, the detailed numbers here, um, but it's certainly something the committee could explore if it wanted to. Mm. Just uh, moving on to the, the sort of corporate function and governance, clearly that's been a problem in SPA now for the last few years. And I think the, the, the just immediate past chair recognised that and so did the CEO. And there was supposed to be a, a focus on capacity building. In your paragraph 31, you state that I remain concerned about the capacity and capability of the Scottish Police Authority corporate function. Given all the changes that have taken place, and I'm assuming that these new board members and so on are supposed to strengthen the board, has there been any change in that position? Does it look stronger than previously? Have these changes made any significant movement in terms of quality and governance? Let me start where you started your question a moment ago, Mr Beattie. As I say in my report, um, and I think it is important to to um, not lose sight of, there have been some real improvements, um, both in terms of the financial management, financial reporting, which is core to our interest, in terms of the transparency and openness with, it, with which the SPA carries out its business. Um, we report also on some improvements in performance reporting that happened um, last year in 2019. And we have had uh, recruitment to some key roles, as we were focusing on just now, um, during 2018-19 as well. So those are all real improvements, and I welcome them. Um, at the same time, though, there has been a delay in really building the uh, corporate capacity and function of the organisation of the Scottish Police Authority, um, the uh, team required to support the authority in carrying out its function under the legislation. And I think that delay... Um, really is a function of the um, lack of agreement, the lack of a shared understanding of what the authority's role is, how it relates to Police Scotland, to government and to the other players in the system, which is where we started this morning. Um, I think that that um, lack of clarity will continue to be a barrier to development until it's resolved, and it's that that's making it harder than it should be to really grapple with some of these challenging questions about what policing in Scotland looks like in the future, what that means in terms of people and staffing, and how we afford it as a country. So for me, the, the underlying problem is that shared understanding of what the authority's role is, and therefore what support it needs, and how it relates to the other players around it. Looking at uh, the comments made by the outgoing chair, despite all the focus on capacity building and all the rest of it, in June 2019, she said that uh, there had been no progress. Why? Um, I, th I think, in a sense, that's a question for the former chair herself, but my view is that it does relate to this um, lack of a shared understanding, not just in the authority, but right across the system, about what, what the authority is there to do and how it relates to the other players in the system. There was also, at the same time, as my report says, um, further turnover in the role of the chief executive. The chief executive who took up post in 2018 um, was uh, left in late 2019 after a period of sickness absence, and that clearly will have held up progress as well, the absence mm -hmm. of the chief executive. But I think it's part of this wider question about what's the SBA there to do and how does it relate to the other players in the system. I'm interested in some of the points you're making there. Looking back at uh, reports that have come in front of this committee over a period of years, there's clearly been a long period of instability and, uh, frankly, poor governance over SPA. Um, your comments as to uncertainty about the role of SPA 
raises the question, is SPA fit, fit for purpose? Is it the right structure? Should it be getting reviewed? Because we go on year by year and we don't seem to be making that step change we need to make this an efficient functioning body. I, I agree with part of your question, but, but I, my concern is that we shouldn't simply be focusing on the Scottish Police Authority in itself. It is part of a wider system of policing that was put in place back in 2013. Um, it was a very major piece of public service reform, probably the biggest we've had since devolution. Um, it was carried out very quickly, as I reported at the time. Um, and I think, as you say, we have seen since the effects of different views from different chairs, different chief execs, um, different chief constables about the role that the SPA plays in relation to Police Scotland and in relation to government. Just as an example of that, um, early in um, the, the creation of the Scottish Police Authority, um, the view of the chair then was that it should have very few staff and that most of the services should be provided by Police Scotland to it. That meant that many roles were filled on um, a temporary basis um, rather than uh, setting up, for example, a strong finance function and putting in place a director of finance. Posts were, were filled on an interim basis. The, um, the, the second chair came with a different view and started in a different direction. Um, and the these shared understandings of what, what the SPA does and how it relates to Police Scotland in particular, but also to government and the inspectorate, I think have never been fully explored. So I do think there's a need to review that, but I don't think it's just about the role of the SPA. I think it's about the system as a whole. An interesting point that you say in your report is that uh, the former chair and some of the other board members operated in a more executive capacity than you would have expected. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, um, I, I think there's, there's two aspects to it. Partly because the organisation itself was and is still underdeveloped, and for part of the period that this report relates to, the chief exec was on sickness absence. Um, there was no alternative but for the chair and other non-executive members, members of the authority, to be um, more involved than I would expect in the running of the organisation. Over and above that, though, I think there are still, as I've said, different views about what the role of the authority ought to be and the extent to which it is like a board which oversees a team of um, executive officers doing work on its behalf and how far it's an authority which, which plays a more direct role itself in overseeing policing. Now, the legislation is, is silent on that um, degree, that nuance of the way in which the authority carries out its work, but it seems to me very clear that there needs to be a common understanding, not just within the members of the authority, but with Police Scotland, with government, with HMICS, of how that's going to work in order to be able to build the organisation, recruit people to it and get it um, to the state where it can operate effectively. Um, I think, the, in my view, the, the amount of time that the chair and some members of the authority were spending last year was more than I would expect for members of a board. But if you're looking at an authority which has a more direct role in overseeing policing, the amount of time required could well be more than was originally envisaged for authority members. That's, that's a bigger question than just the amount of time spent by the individuals. Do you think at this point, given several years down the line and where we are now, do you think there is a case now for the Scottish Government to step in and define those roles and, you know, clarify in order to... Be, are they going to be able to work this out themselves or is somebody else going to have to do it for them? I, I don't think they can do it themselves. I think it has to be a shared process. I think it has to involve... Yes, the SPA and Police Scotland, but also government and HMICS, um, making sure that they all can um, agree a vision, a set of working practices that are clear about who does what, who's accountable to whom, the accountable officer lines and impo another important part of this, and then um, equip themselves to carry out those roles without the, the ground constantly being shifted as individual players change in it. Just one last question. The, the, we've really touched on it. The SPA is... The SPA chair's input increased substantially during the, the period. The, I think it went up to 20 days a month, wasn't it? Now, that was agreed with the Scottish Government. That extra input, do you think it was justified? And do you think, do you think that the former chair suggested and defined the increase, or was it at the request of the Government? Um, 
You're right, it was agreed with Scottish Government um, along with a set of agreed objectives for the chair. Um, I think it's important to remember that at the point when the um, former chair was appointed, uh, policing in Scotland had been through a, a very difficult period with the departure of the former <coughs> chief constable, um, the former chair of the authority and the former chief executive of the authority. Um, and as I say in the report, um, the former chair was involved in an awful lot of work to make um, appointments to the authority and to Police Scotland um, to uh, change the governance arrangements, increase the openness and transparency. So in the circumstances, I think it was justified. But in terms of the, um, the way in which at present the role of the SPA is understood, it is more than I would expect a chair and indeed some other non-executive members to be uh, spending um, in uh, carrying out their role. So I'm not criticising the individual, I'm saying it's another indication of a system where roles and responsibilities aren't clearly defined. And ju just a small point I asked about uh, whether it was the chair that suggested the increase or whether it was the Scottish Government that asked the chair to increase the input. My understanding is that it was the, uh, the result of a dialogue between the two of them. I don't know who initiated that dialogue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. David Stewart. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning. I've got a very straightforward um, uh, point. The annual audit report, as you well know, pointed out that without a corporate plan and planning framework, the SPA cannot assess its own performance in holding Police Scotland to account. Could you expand on that point? Um, certainly. Um, the SPA has been focusing on um, the direction of policing as a whole and engaging with Police Scotland um, on the, the way in which performance reporting back to the authority will happen so far. Um, it hasn't put in the work needed so far to be clear about its own role, which is a recurring point we've been coming back to this morning. Mark, I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about what we were seeing in there. So I think as the report report says that Police Scotland um, in the early part of 2019 established a, a new performance framework which was a, which was a significant step forward in um, providing performance management information, performance reporting which the SPA could then, then use. What was lacking is, is something for the SPA itself to go beyond that to, to sort of look more broadly at, the, at that information, place it in a wider context against other benchmarks and also give itself a system for assessing how well it was doing in terms of mm. holding Police Scotland to account. So I think what we were arguing for there was um, for the SPA to, to look at something which would allow it to assess its performance in holding to account and also take a broader view um, of the information that's provided to it by Police Scotland. And do you have any insights into why there's been a delay by the SPA in developing the corporate plan? I think it probably comes comes back to um, some of the issues that the Auditor General has mentioned about about the the, the um, limited capacity within Scottish Police Authority as an organisation, um, the large amount of turbulence that has gone gone on over the last few years, um, the fact that we've had a number of interim chief executives. Um, um, in, in place and the chief executive who, who was on a long-term sickness, um, all have, have, have kind of slowed progress in, in doing that. I think there's clear recognition that it's, it's an important thing that needs to be done, but I think the capacity of the organisation has not been there to do it. Hmm. it. It seems to me that um, this is extremely central. I understand there's been turbulence and change and movement, but it's effectively having no financial compass, isn't it? And, you know, to continue my analogies, it's like who is guarding the guards in this situation? Um, have you any insights why this, uh, is this a matter of urgency for the future? This we, is crucial. We absolutely think this, this is important. And, and as you say, having that, that compass or, and all the other associated instrumentation that goes, goes with that is absolutely vital for the SPA to, to know in the broadest sense, how well Police Scotland is performing and delivering against its priorities and against policing 2026, and also how well it as an organisation is performing in, in um, holding Police Scotland to account. And that comes back to the wider point we've been discussing about the clarity about the roles and responsibilities of SPA. Mm. And clearly we'll have a new, uh, presumably a new chair appointed at some stage in the, in the future. Um, have you any insights again that is this a matter of top priority for the new board and the, and the new chair? So at the moment there is an, an interim chair in place. Um, I'm not clear. I would have to come back to you as to whether or not there's any defined timeline. I don't know if Stephen knows for, for establishing something, but it may also be something which is awaiting the um, arrival and appointment of um, a permanent new chair. Okay. Right. Thank you, Convener. 
David Bill Bowen. Thank you. Morning. Can I stick with the annual audit report? I've got one or two points to raise there. Um, firstly, that you, you made the point that um, neither the performance report nor the governance statement reference reported weaknesses in the SPA's corporate function. And you said that your audit opinion requires you to consider the consistency of disclosures and identify any potentially misleading information. This omission was deemed to be an issue in both respects. Now, I think you maybe got that adjusted in the final um, financial statements. But do you know how this omission occurred? Thank you. Good, um, good morning. Yes, you're right. Um, the unaudited accounts that were provided to us <clears throat> didn't reflect the, the very significant comments that the chair made um, in one of our, our, the former chair and one of our board reporting about the weakness um, of the SPA corporate function. <clears throat> and it was our judgment that that required to be reflected in, in the governance statement. Um, we probably don't have a, a very detailed answer for you, Mr Bowman, as to why <clears throat> that wasn't picked up. I think my, um, my assumption is, reflects the fact that <clears throat> excuse me, that the accounts, the preparation of the accounts involve a large number of parties um, within the Scottish Police Authority, more so than in other organisations, whereby um, it, the, the finance department um, and then corporate functions play an important role. That involves both officials and board members from the Scottish Police Authority and <clears throat> um, largely finance officials from Police Scotland. Something fell through those arrangements. Um, we were pleased that it was quickly recognised that this was an important disclosure that had to be made and, and as you can see from the, the final version of the annual report and accounts that it does make the necessary disclosures but um, we're also reassured that the, the need for full disclosure and recognising the, the full suite of events um, is recognised and, and part of their plans for the 1920 annual report and accounts. So would that suggest that nobody reads these financial statements from cover to cover apart from yourself? Um, I, I'm not sure I would kind of make that judgment. I think we we, we make many judgments through, during the, through the course of the audit. What we receive in the unaudited accounts is an important milestone um, in the accounts. And it's a point that we've been trying to make, not, not to be fair, not just with SPA Police Scotland, but really across all public bodies, is that the unaudited accounts themselves are a statement of public bodies' um, financial results for the year gone, it shouldn't, by the stage that they come to be provided to auditors, they, it shouldn't be still regarded as uh, another iteration in the process. And it's emphasising that point. We think um, SP and Police Scotland recognise that and expect to see that coming through during the audit that we'll undertake over the course of the summer. So there's a risk that they might see you as part of the accounts preparation process rather than a, a, a reporting function on a, on a complete set of financial statements? <clears throat> I think arguably that's, I think that's a risk in, in any audit, Mr Bowman, that, um, that the auditors, we are very clear on, on the boundaries of our role and the independence um, of, of the auditors. Um, nonetheless, we will make sure that we read every single word in the annual report and accounts and ensure that we draw on our wider source of evidence. And one of those examples is the, is the one you referred to as the, the comments of the former chair. I also looked in a little bit more detail in the in the report because I remember from last year, I think an issue came up about um, board members' expenses not being fully supported or, or something like that. And I think that's maybe been, been dealt with um, in the current year. But I noticed uh, one of two things, for example, that there doesn't seem to be a, a strategic risk register. and. The implementation date was that of 31 December 2019. The procurement strategy didn't seem to be in place and the timescale for that was 20, September 2020, quite a long time ahead. And also that there's a brought forward issue from the previous year to do with weaknesses in um, the imperial system and the processing of journal entries. Now, you know, processing of journal entries is something that you know, lots of let's call them frauds, are, are often centred on because you can make adjustments right into the heart of financial statements. And that, that doesn't actually give a, a completion date, um, but just further improvements have been agreed. Now, do we have a, a competent and fully functioning and, um, audit committee here who are on top of all of this? Or, you know, this seems to be a lot of serious issues, some from the past, that are still being worked on beyond dates of even this meeting. Maybe if I can answer um, those points in turn, I think in, in reverse order, if I may. Um, yes, I think we do have a competent functioning audit committee within the SPA that 
um, does track audit recommendations both from ourselves um, internal audit and broadening out its scope to actually think about the recommendations that it receives from other organisations who have commented on the work of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority, for example, the Information Commissioner's activity too. I think that, that is functioning well. Um, in terms of the, the points that, that we've made, the, um, the SPA doesn't yet have a functioning strategic risk register and I think that's as a consequence really as some of the other issues we, we've talked about um, this morning about the lack of capacity and capability within the SPA. In contrast, Police Scotland does have a well-developed um, risk management function and reporting and that also is coming to the SPA audit committee. So we're reassured that that arrangement um, is in place. There is more to do and it's something that we'll continue to track in terms of the SPA's risk management arrangements. Procurement, that you mentioned Mr Bowman, um, has been an issue um, within Police Scotland. It's one that they have identified and are working through in terms of quite a detailed um, improvement programme, um, getting a, a far stronger handle on their contract management arrangements, monitoring and, and recording of that. Um, it's a big piece of work and it's one that they are, they are making progress on and one that both ourselves and internal audit uh, are tracking. Um, and lastly, the point about payroll has undoubtedly improved. This, this was a real, an area of key weakness in terms of um, the control environment and one that our colleagues in internal audit have made a number of very important recommendations on. We're really pleased to see that those recommendations have been implemented. I think it's large, in a lot of ways, helped to some of the investment that Police Scotland have made in their payroll functioning, having inherited a, a wide variation of payroll arrangements and payroll centres from the move to the National Police Force. They now have a, almost a, a single payroll function, which, in, and I think within the next few months, will move to a place really for the first time that all members uh, of uh, all of officers and members will all be paid on the same date from the same and that's taken a lot of work and effort uh, to get to that stage as ever as the auditor general mentioned is that that 85 percent of the costs within police scotland accounts relate to staff costs it will always remain a, a very important part of our audit work to get the assurance we need um, and general entries just to, to finish on you're quite right general entries um are such an important point of the control environment for any set of annual reporting accounts that as, as effective as that allows uh, for the, and increases the risk of manipulation of any set of accounts that a journal entry is posted that changes the resultant disclosures in, in the accounts. Um, we include a, a very significant amount of testing in our work to gain the assurances that we need that the journals that have been posted to prepare the accounts um, are correct and accurate. The committee will recall from a couple of years ago that, that there was one example of a miscoding of a journal and what, how that related to the disclosure and the remuneration report. We've not seen any examples this year and I'm pleased that that allowed us to get to a point to provide a, a clean audit opinion um, on the annual reporting accounts. So although there are quite a number of issues which if you take them at face value look quite serious, you're saying that this is um, dramatic, it's not like a, a festering sore, it's a healing wound that's the situation we have. I think <clears throat> absolutely right. I think you know, as, as the annual audit report and, and as the Auditor General has noted in the Section 22 report, we've seen really clear improvements in financial management and the control environment um, within Police Scotland. Um, and it's not, it's not that long ago that um, these sets of accounts were signed off in December with um, modifications to the audit opinion. Police Scotland's accounts are now signed off in September. It's consistent for large complex public bodies. So um, absolutely, we would recognise the improvement that has been in financial management and the control environment during the, the past few years. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Bill. A uh, couple questions from me, if I may, just before we wrap up. Uh, firstly, your report notes that an estates strategy is now in place, uh, but the annual audit report indicates that 150 million of the 400 million investment required over the next 10 years is not guaranteed. Uh, and will be a risk to the SPA's ability to carry out this work. Uh, can you comment on that level of risk and what is the SPA doing to address that? <clears throat> so I, um, I guess ultimately, convener, it's part of the wider funding requirement that the SPA has identified that, that it needs to transform its activities. What that means for how and where it will deliver services are in part um, reflected in 
um, its estate strategy as it a, if it's part of the overall suite of strategies to deliver uh, policing 2026. By way of example, and as, as captured in the strategy, it talks about you know, where police officers will be based, the type, whether it involves moving to sharing of services with uh, other public bodies and so forth, given the, the drop in footfall that has been experienced into uh, police stations in recent years. For the services that it currently operates and the premises that it used to deliver these services, some of them are not in a good state of repair and, and do require investment. And that's what really that paragraph that you mentioned look, looks to capture, that um, there is a need to invest to ensure that it addresses the backlog maintenance re requirement that has built up in some of its estate as well. So there'll be some key decision points ultimately for the police as to whether it looks to move away from some of the, the premises and services where it's been delivering those services and deliver policing uh, in a different way. But all of that captures the, I guess, the scale of risk that um, until it has clarity around its financial position, um, it, the challenge to how it will plan to deliver services into the medium and long term. Thank you. Uh, final question from me. The former chair's total remuneration for about 11 months was over £200,000. Given what you know about the changes and perhaps advances that have been made during that time, do you consider that that represents value for money to the taxpayer? Um, the figure that's included in my report, convener, is around 125,000 for the 2018-19 year, which is what um, this report looks at. Um, and as I said in response to an earlier question, I think in the circumstances, that was reasonable. We know it was agreed by the Scottish Government and we know that the Government also agreed a series of objectives reflecting the, the um, situation when the Chair took over in December 2017. We haven't yet looked at the 2019-20 um, expenses up until the former Chair's date of resignation last month, um, but my understanding is that the number of days for which she was claiming had come down from the peak in 2018-19. I can't give you detailed figures, but that's my understanding at this stage. Thank you. Do members have any further questions? Absent which, uh, I'd like to thank the Auditor General and your team uh, for their evidence this morning. And I now close the public part of this meeting as the committee moves into private session. <laughs>